good versus evil. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you yeah. see it at all. Yeah. And um, so anyway, that's all I'm going to say about it tonight. But, you know, it's just to pray, you know, in all of it. And I don't know how it's all going to shake out. None of us do. But just pray for God's will to be done. Amen. You know, that's all you can say. And that's not some cop out. It's the best way out. It's just asking the Lord to just have his way in the situation, and guess what? It will. Amen. <laughs> so that's the blessing of it. And, um, but, all right, good for that. Um, just think, just before you start, just think, he's the only president we have ever had that's got the thing done with this bro. Yeah, yeah. And they said it couldn't be done. Yeah, even more than Reagan. Yeah. Yes, yes sir. All right. Going to my notes, and at times I've been wrong, uh, we did get through, and I think we ended up at chapter 33. That's what I have written down. Um, that's where we left off. I even wrote down the, the date, pick up on 12-2, so I assume that's right. All right, so we're going to be starting in, in chapter 33. And here, anybody remember the name of the gentleman who is speaking now from the last time we met? A young man. Young man, very good. Anybody know his name? No. Elihu. And so this is who we've been talking about there the last couple, or at least a couple chapters here, or chapter 32. And then he goes into chapter 33. He has a lot to say. He goes on to chapter 34 as well, and we'll be talking about him here. Um, <clears throat> so here in, in, and again, picking up in point number two, um, and point number two's blank there is Elihu's response to Job. Elihu's response to Job. And um, I'll go ahead and just give you we're going to go down through, hopefully, through chapter 33 tonight. Um, I was going to give you the blanks, because I tend to forget if I don't. So, Elihu's response to Job, A, is God is gracious. God is gracious, that's point A. Uh, point number one is Job... Uh, you are wrong in charging God as your enemy. Enemy is the blank in point number one under A. Alright, and then two, God uses various ways, ways to speak to man. So ways would be the would be the blank under point two under A. What is what's that again, Justin? Uh, point number two yeah. is ways, W-A-Y-S. Okay. God uses various ways to speak to man. And then point three is God's purpose in disciplinary, disciplinary, not simply punitive. How is you, is disciplinary, not simply punitive. How do you spell that word? Oh, okay. Um, God's purpose is, how do you spell it? it D I S C I P L I N A R R. N A, okay. Yeah. All right. Anybody, anybody need any of those, any of those repeated? No well, wonder I couldn't spell it. You say it's somewhere just in my right.
ways he can help Job. Help Job. Let's keep going. Oh, okay. Maybe I didn't give you those. No, you didn't. All right. Uh, and then number one was heart. He speaks pure knowledge from an upright heart. And then number two, he can be as Job's spokesman before God. And, and we're going to back up to actually that point again, just to reiterate, because it really flows into chapter into point two. And so here, let's look at here in verse one, and again, we'll just recap, it's been a couple of weeks. And, and so here, and again, I've got a few different notes, actually, there's all kinds of things I've written down here, um, things that come to mind along with this study. Um, dealing with Elihu and how he's coming off. But, again, so it's, he can, uh, for he believes he can help Job. And, and so then here in, in um, point two, or, or point, um, point one there, beginning in verse one, it says, uh, please, but please, Job, hear my speech and listen to all my words. Now I open my mouth uh, and my tongue speaks in my mouth my words come from my upright heart. My lips utter pure knowledge. And here in the first few verses here, we see, and, and we go, well, let's go on in, uh, through verse 7 in, the, in this portion. In verse 4 says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Set your words in order before me, and take your stand. Truly, I am, uh, I am as your spokesman before God. I also have been formed out of clay, and surely no fear of me will terrify you, nor will my hand be heavy on you. Now, a couple different things we're going to point out here along with this portion, and again, quite a few different things that wrote down here. Verses 1 through 7 in, in particular, as far as all those verses together, I wrote this as far as just a side note, Elihu has a gift of speaking without saying much, mainly a windy introduction to the rest of his speech. All true, but windy. You think about verses 1 through 7 here, he's basically saying or restating everything that Job had already stated previously. Think about what he's saying. Look, look at the words. He says, but please, Job, hear my speech. So right off the bat, he's already begging him to listen to him. What would be some reasons why we would say that he's having to say this from what we remember from the last study? Anybody remember? A couple different things probably pop up. Anybody remember what we were talking about with Elihu? He was, he was the youngest. So, and then, he, and, and the way he came off, Right when he started speaking, was as if you know he were the most spiritual of the bunch, and he couldn't, you know, he just couldn't wait to be able to uh, basically go after the other friends for not really communicating that Job truly was sinning and get him to basically recant. If you recall that, he was upset about that, um, and so just how he was coming off was really almost resentful. Uh, so then we have these verses where he starts off by saying, but please, Job, hear my speech. So I don't know if it's his body language at this point or what the case is that makes him say this. But here he's already begging Job to listen to him. And he goes on and he says, to listen to my words. He talks about, I open my mouth, my tongue speaks in my mouth. You're brilliant, right? Uh, my, my words come from my upright heart. My lips utter pure knowledge. And, and we mentioned this last time too. It sounds very boastful, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Just exactly how he's like lifting himself up. And then he goes on in verse 4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Job had already talked about all this. He, he already knows this to be true. Uh, verse 5. Uh, if you can answer me, set your words in order before me and take your stand. 
Now, this is the verse number six. This is the one that kind of gets you if you think about the word. It says, truly I am as your spokesman before God. Who, who, who is Elihu? <laughs> so basically, here, Elihu still believes that Job is a sinner. He's not admitting his sinfulness, so therefore God is not going to hear Job. And Elihu's coming off like, you know, if you'll just listen, I'll be your spokesperson because he's so spiritual before God. Job doesn't need Elihu to come before God. We don't need anyone to be able to come before God. Even today, we don't need someone else to represent us. We have true access before God. And Job had the same. So here, Elihu didn't need, or Job didn't need Elihu as a spokesperson. And for and for Elihu to be making this statement here, it really comes off as, as almost a super spiritual type of attitude, if you think about that. And then he goes on and says, I also have been formed out of clay. Surely no fear of, of me will terrify you, nor will my hand be heavy on you. Uh, a couple other thoughts under these uh, verses here. Um, verses, uh, in verses 4 through 7, touches on pride, saying that his spiritual discerning was as, uh, as good as the elders, if not more. So he's almost coming off like, the elders weren't really able to get him to recant, and he's almost lifting himself up above the other elders, the other four friends that had come, and this is how he is coming off. And also he believes he would be an effective spokesman for Job to God. Um, I thought this was interesting. I uh, came across this in, in studying this. Uh, this one theologian by the last name of Mason said this. This is a quote. He said, despite the good... A life, uh, despite the good, the life who states the facts. Re the fact remains um, that he is an astonishingly pompous little windbag. He he takes the first uh, and a half of the second chapter, or he takes the first chapter and half of the second chapter, basically to clear his throat and announce that he is he has something to say. And that's what Mason basically said of this whole portion of Scripture. And so basically you kind of see that, don't you? I mean, just kind of how he, his whole attitude and everything's coming off uh, very pompous is exactly what he said and very true. So we come down through verse 7 here of this of chapter, uh, chapter 33, and this is basically where that point ended off there in D, and that's where we ended last time. Uh, point two, <clears throat> again, where we're beginning tonight, the Bible's response to Job, in verse eight, says God is gracious. God is gracious, and, and here Job, uh, in point one, Job, you are wrong. Uh, you are wrong in charging God as your enemy. And so we see this in verses eight through verse 30, 13. Now let's go ahead and read these verses. In verse eight says, Surely you have spoken in my hearing. And I have heard the sound of your words, saying, I am pure. And, and now listen, pay attention to this. Notice what he, he's saying here in verse 8. He says, surely you have spoken in my hearing. And I have, and now listen, this is a lie who's speaking here. He says, and I have heard the sound of your words, saying, basically, so, what he's, so get the picture here before we go any further. So what I'm saying is, I have heard you say, what he's about to say, what and uh, what Job he says that Job is was, has already said. He's saying that this is what I've heard you say, and notice what it says. It says, "And I have heard the sound of your words, saying, I am pure without transgression; I am innocent, and there is no iniquity in me." Did Job ever say that? No. Job never said that. He never said that he was totally pure and without transgression. And, and then especially the end, I am innocent and there is no iniquity in me. He never said that he was sinless. Ever. He never said that. So right off the bat, here you see Elihu saying, this is what I heard you say, and it's not what Job had said at all. 
So, so once again, he's not even listening. He hadn't even ult ultimately been listening. He was hearing what he wanted to hear. And it wasn't anything that Job had said. So this is what you have so far. And then it goes on. And he says in verse 10, Yet he finds occasions against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks. He watches all my paths. Then he says in verse 12, uh, Look, in this you are not righteous. I will answer you, for God is greater than man. Why do you contend with him? And so here in these uh, first few verses here, from 8 down through verse 13, we, this is exactly what Elihu is saying that, that he either Job had stated or this is what he's seen from what Job said. And here are a couple different things to point out here underneath this. Look under A, where Elihu is under uh, point one of, uh, little a underneath the point one there, under uh, the big A. Uh, it says, Elihu had, uh, has heard Job profess his innocence while counting God as his enemy. And here is wrote a little side note to that. He states in verses 8 through 11 that he has listened carefully to Job's words, but nothing could be further from the truth. And then, B, under B, where it says, this is not right, for God is greater than man and not accountable to man. He is stating, uh, he is stating that since Job isn't righteous, and Elihu, quote unquote, is, that he, he will state that God is greater than man. So, did, did Job already know that God's greater than man? Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, right? We've already, he'd already been having discourses here, even talking to God at times through the text that we've already been through. So, but you have to keep, you have to keep this in mind. Elihu, and again, not to keep badgering this point, but Elihu is, is, Steadfast in his mind that Job has sinned. And once again, God's not going to have a relationship or even speak to someone who is in sin. So that's in, in Elihu's mind here in this text. So basically, when you come to this portion of scripture here, and then again, um, there where, where he is again, he's stating that, um, that for God is greater than man and not accountable to man. And which is true. That is true, isn't it? God's not accountable to us. Um, we're accountable to him. He's the creator. So that is true, what he's stating. But it's it's why he's stating it. And that's and that again in, in essence is, is an issue. Um, and, and so then and then also uh, going on into um, Point two there, God uses various ways to speak to man. That picks up in verse 14. Notice here, in verse, beginning in verse 14, where he says, uh, or actually, let's back up one second. Back to verse 12, where he says, Look, in this you are not righteous. I will answer you, for God is greater than man. So once again, giving credence there in verse 12, that he believes that he's not righteous. He's flat out telling him he's not righteous. And, and he says, I will answer you. For, great, for God is greater than man. And, and once again, that little air of super spirituality here. It goes on to verse 13. Why do you contend with him? For he does not give an accounting of anything of his words. And then, and again, it's true, he doesn't. But then verse 14 picks up, he says, For God, uh, for God may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it. In a dream... And notice here, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction in order to turn man from his deed and conceal pride from man. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. But then notice in verse 19, it says, Man is also chastised with pain. So we see number one, he said, beginning in verse 14, where he says that God speaks in one way or another. Then he goes into verse 15, where he talks about a dream. 
So he's saying that sometimes God gives us even visions to be able to help us to be able to, as he says in verse 15, the midway down, when deep sleep falls upon men while some are in their beds, verse 16, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction, basically what they are to do. And again, this is all geared toward, and this is all true, and, and, and God speaks to different people to get their attention in different ways. And by the way, God will do whatever he needs to do to get our attention even today. He'll do whatever that is, whether it's health, whether it's loss of whatever. He'll do whatever's necessary to be able to get our attention. And, and he does. So none, none, none of this is false in the ways that he does this, but he's basically, again, applying this towards Job. So he's saying that, that even in a dream, and again, he's applying this, or he then he goes back around to what Job is really going through in verse 19, and he says, man is also chast the chastened, or chastened, sorry, with pain on his bed, and with strong pain in many of his bones. It's almost like one of those that will, you know, Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, that's you, Joe. And this is exactly what's going on here. So he's, he's basically, he's saying it like, you know, this could happen to anybody, but it's like, he's directing it in a roundabout way back to Joe. And then he goes on and he says in verse 20, so that his life abhors bread and his soul succulent food, his flesh wastes away from sight and his bones stick out which once were not seen. Actually, if you stop and think about it, that he's directing this at Job, it's actually a bigger picture here of probably even what Job actually looked like. Uh, a lot of commentators believe this, too, as far as that this is maybe an actual exact picture of what Job actually looked like at this point. And if you think about it, it wouldn't make sense, would it? I mean, here you not only had all this loss, you have pain with, with I don't think we can describe the amount of pain that Job's in at this point with the boils and, and everything else that goes along with that. You talk about the infection that comes with that, this racking his body, I'm sure, at this point as well. I mean, it goes on and on and on. So he's going through all of this. I'm sure he's losing weight. I'm sure with the pain, anytime you're in pain, you really don't want to eat at all anyway, much less being in this type of pain. So you can see almost that these verses really are painting a picture of how Job is, but not necessarily why he's going through it, right? Because what what is he what is Elihu painting this picture? What is the reasoning? He's trying to get Job to admit what he hasn't admitted to the other friends. And what was that? That he's a sinner, right? That he's sinned. He's basically presenting all this as quote unquote God's spokesperson to get Job basically come clean with God. So he's painting this picture here, and then he goes on in verse 22, and he says, yes, his soul draws near the pit and his life to the executioners. And so once again, here you see the whole picture here of exactly what's going on and what, what Elihu's painting this uh, dreary picture at this point of Job. Uh, a couple other thoughts here. Uh, under this portion, Elihu is round the barn, and I put this as a side note, and it's around the barn stating that Job is being visited by God in dreams and uh, through his pain to get him to admit sin and to know truth and to follow it. And that's really what we're seeing here. And he goes on in verse 23, and it says, and if there is a messenger for him, a mediator, one among the thousand, to show man his uprightness, then he is gracious to him and says, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have followed a ransom. Now, who is, who is the mediator here that he's talking about? It's himself. He believes he's the mediator between Job and God. Right. So, here again, he's telling Job, everything that he's saying is not necessarily false, but it's how he's saying it. And he's making basically... He's trying to get Job to admit sin while elevating himself. That's really what's going on. And you continue to see that. In verse 24, again, then he is gracious to him and says, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be 
young, like a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He's also going to make a point there underneath that one verse there, verse 24, where he says he's gracious to him and says, deliver him from going down to the pit. Ultimately, who is it that's the one that's gracious in delivering from going down to the pit? Jesus yeah. Christ. God, right? You think about our lives. Who is the one that was gracious in our lives from helping us from going down into the pit or ultimately hell? Right? Amen. And it was God. So he has it right, because it is God that delivers from going down to the pit inevitably. But once again, he's he's giving this on a false premise because of, once again, Job's sin. Verse 25 says, His flesh shall be young like a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. Verse 26, He shall pray to God, and he will delight in him. He shall see his face with joy. And this and again, he's painting the picture now. If you were to change your ways and recant your ways and admit that God um, is that that God that you sin against God and that you and basically ask for forgiveness, then he paints a prettier picture from verse 26 to 28. Where again in verse 26 he says, and he shall pray, aka Job. Uh, and he will delight in him, and he shall see his face with joy, for he restores to man his righteousness. And does he do that? Absolutely. Uh, that's exactly what ha should happen in our lives. If we were to sin, we should immediately run to God, asking his forgiveness, turning our, our backs on that sin, and then, it, and then God will actually grant forgiveness and restore that righteousness, right? And so what a blessing that is, even for us today. Verse 27 says, Then he looks at men and says, I have sinned and perverted what was right, and it did not profit me. He will redeem his soul from going down to the pit, and his life shall see the light. So once again, he's painting this picture that if a person, again, he's, he's not just saying this generally, He's saying it around the barn, as we put it earlier, towards Job. So he's basically saying, if you will do this, this is what you'll see, or how you'll see God respond to you. And again, here, um, he, he, in verse 27, then he looks at men and says, I have sinned. Who would be the other men he's talking about? He's talking about his friends that are there, ultimately Elihu, because those, those are the men that are there. And he's basically saying, if you, you know, if this person will admit their sins, he says, I have sinned and perverted what was right, and it did not profit me at it. He then will redeem his soul from going down to the pit, and his life shall see the light. Once again, we come back to the question. What's the problem here? He didn't sin. He didn't sin, right? So once again... It's a, I mean, it's just round and round and round the barn, right? Because they keep bringing all these things up. And here's the thing. If Job had sinned, would Elihu be at least half right? Yes, he would be exactly right. The, the other half would be that he's arrogant in how he's presenting it. But he would be exactly right as far as his knowledge of God. And that is true. But the problem is is that Job had not sinned. I mean, how many times have we had to say that, right? And, and I thought about this. I, I didn't put that down here. I don't believe. Um, no, I did not. But can you imagine being Job at this point? Um, actually, I did. All right, this, all right here's, here's what I wrote. I put, Job either wrote... Or, oh, wait, hang on. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll come back to that point because it's down at the end of the at the end of the chapter here. So let's go ahead and read verses 29 and down through verse 33 because these are the last verses of the chapter here. It says, "Give ear, Job, listen to me." Now, now listen. You have to kind of. I kind of look at this as a little humorous, but he says, "Give ear, Job, listen to me. Hold your peace, and I will speak. If you have anything to say, answer me." Speak, or speak, for I desire to justify you. If not, listen to me. Hold your peace, and I will teach you wisdom. So again, we don't know what happened here, 
that all of a sudden he has to say this? Because he says, give ear, Job, listen to me. So I don't know if he, Job rolled his eyes at this point, if he got up to say something back to Elihu, whatever the case may be, it's all conjecture. We don't know what happened. But as far as the wording, he says, give ear, Job, listen to me, hold your peace, and I will speak. Once again, a little prideful, you know. And once again, you have to remember, here's the youngest guy almost telling all these older individuals, you know, you know, you basically don't know what you're talking about. Sit down and I'll inform you. That's basically what he's saying. And then he goes on in verse 32, if you have anything to say, answer me and speak for I desire to justify you. What's the danger in that statement? Is Elihu the one that can justify? Absolutely not. I mean, he thinks he's the Pope here at this point. You know, he thinks, oh, I'm, I'm the, inter inter you know, the intermediary uh, between you and God. Who is, who is Elihu to make that comment? And then you come down to this verse where he says, for I desire to justify you. <laughs> he, he might desire for Job to be justified in his mind, but he is not the justifier of Job's sin. God alone is the one that can justify. And then he ends this chapter by saying, if not, then listen to me. Hold your peace, and I will teach you wisdom. So with all that said, and that's where we end on this chapter tonight, but here's a couple different thoughts that I put underneath this. Um, Elihu, in verses 29 through 30, Elihu is spelling out that God is being extremely patient with Job. If that were true, that Job sinned, would God be patient at this point? Yes. God could have just killed Job, by the way. If all this had happened because of some great sin that Job had done, he could have done that, right? But he had not. And so once again, uh, and, but this is how basically the Bible was presenting it, that God had been extremely patient with you at this point in trying to get your attention. He's taken away all this from you and then and brought all these friends here to try to get you to see your error and you're still not doing it. God's being extremely patient. But then verses 31 through 33, I put this, I, and this is where I kind of put a little bit of conjecture, but Job either rose to speak and answered or rolled his eyes or made some gesture to cause Elihu to, um, to share his words in these three verses, verses 31 to 33. In the end, there was nothing now that Elihu stated, nor that Job didn't know already. Nothing at this point Job didn't know already. He had already, he'd already stated probably 90% of what Elihu had already stated in these two chapters. He already knew that. So once again, and I put this and underlined it twice, Job was a very, I put very in caps, very patient man. Can you imagine being Job? <laughs> and again, this is, this is where, kind of where we'll end if no one other thing to talk about. But can you imagine being Job at this point? Put yourself in his place. You had not sinned, and yet you have all these individuals, I mean, nagging, nagging, nagging. Then you've got the young star, upstart, you know, coming around, you know. Okay, these three guys didn't know what they're talking about, but I'm going to get you to admit your sin. I hadn't sinned. <laughs> I mean, how, how, how much does Job have to tell them, you know? I mean, I cannot imagine being in Job's position. You know, as if the other three friends weren't enough, and probably Job thought that was probably the end of it. Not so fast, right? Here comes Elijah. Uh, so once again, we see, and, and once again, you see the patience of Job. You know, you hear that statement, the patience of Job. I, 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 if he didn't have patience already going through all the loss, he definitely had to have a lot of patience dealing with these individuals, right? Um, without knocking their block off at this time. Then here, I just put in closing. And it's actually a question for you, for you to answer. What is, and this is one thing that hit me when I was at, at the end of this chapter. What is the one thing none of the accusing friends have done for or with Job to this point? Think about this. What is one thing that none of the accusers, the friends, have done with or to Job at this point? Pray. That's it. 
exactly right. Pray. Duh, right? I mean, you think about you think about this. You see, if I saw a person in this church going through the amount of loss that they had, that Job had gone through, lost his health, lost everything but his wife, and then went to go and, and then went over to his house and asked him, "What kind of great sin have you done?" <laughs> who, who, who am I, right? So here's the one thing we don't see up to this point, and it's just more of a no-brainer sort of, you, you really could say, is why have they not prayed with this man? We spend, Brother Terry, he, 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 he's, he's very meticulous and helpful to me, and, and along with the other deacons, and keeping up with individuals' needs. That's a blessing. Why? Because prayer is important. These, these prayer request lists that we put together, it's not, it's not a who's who, you know, so we can make sure we're keeping up with everyone. It's so that we know how to pray for them. And we know how to come before God on their behalf. This is one thing that these accusers have not done to this point. They haven't even prayed with him once. Not once has he even been mentioned. You know, so... So you, the question has to be raised, how spiritual are they? <laughs> they say they're really spiritual, but the one thing they haven't even done once to even think about doing is to pray with this man. Here in closing is with this. And this is from C.H. Spurgeon, and it's a quote from C.H. Spurgeon. We'll close with this. And he said this, No man can do me a Truer, truer kindness in this world than to pray for me. Isn't that something? He said, no man can do me a truer kindness in this world than to pray for me. And you think about that, C.H. Spurgeon, one of the greatest uh, preachers that we'll ever know, right? That God used in great and mighty ways. We're still reading his works and reading his sermons and and, and, and being able to be blessed by C.H. Spurgeon. But yet he comes to the end and he says that there's no truer kindness than a person prays for him. And here we have Job, who's going through everything that he's going through. And no one, none of these quote-unquote spiritual friends, have even thought to pray for him. That should be a really a wake-up call for us too, shouldn't it? And I tell you, that's that's one thing that hit me right between the between the eyes and preparing this lesson is is that if nothing else, if you don't get anything else tonight, that what's been said other than a lie who's quote unquote spirituality um, is the fact that we need to be praying for one another. We have no idea what's going on with one another. Just like Job, in the end, these 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 friends had no idea what Job was really going through. And, and, and you think about it, Job's expressing vocally a lot of what he's saying, but do we always vocalize everything that we're feeling in our hearts? No. You know, and I don't think he's doing that either because he knows that these people ultimately really don't care. They just want him to admit sin. So he's probably keeping probably at least 85 to 90% of how he's really feeling his heart to himself. He doesn't even have a quote-unquote true friend to be able to come to, to be able to pour his heart out and to pray with before the Lord about these things. So once again, I think that this should be ultimately here as we close a great example to, for us to be able to realize how much that we need to be praying for one another. Um, and then again, I'm sure Job would have been probably falling out over and probably into the campfire. He saw somebody say, you know what, Job? We're going to take a break from all this, and let's just pray for you. He would have probably passed out at this point because of all that he'd already heard. But once again, we see that the importance of prayer. Um, and so once again, all right, is there, is there any, other, um, any other thoughts, any, anything else that we wanted to interject before we close, or anything that we missed? 
The other had something to do with it. It's something like the other thought about it. What you see is, too, these guys uh, think like a Catholic priest, don't they? <laughs> I mean, but I mean, don't, don't, how did they get that custom? For current crazy places. I mean, how did that come to be? You know? Right. Until that day for 